This morning, we're going to be talking about joy. Uh, joy is one of those things that I think we all want to have. It's something that everyone is searching for. And I think, uh, more importantly, it's a necessity for, for our life. I mean, we need to be joyful. And that's one of the things that Jesus came to give us. He came to give us joy. He said that uh, a few very important times. Joy, in fact, comes from being confident in what we know about Jesus. It comes from the foundation of knowing the doctrine of Jesus Christ and the fact that we are saved. It thrives as we grow in our love for Jesus, and it overflows in our hope of the glory to be revealed when Jesus comes again. Joy is something that we should all have. Um, I'm a huge fan. Before I freak everyone out, I'm just going to apologize. I love Christmas movies. I probably have said that a few times. And I watch Christmas movies, believe it or not, year-round. I do. I'm sorry, okay? I watch it year-round. I know you guys are thinking this guy's a loser, and it's, it's true. But I watch Christmas movies probably almost every night before I go to bed uh, during the year. I mean, especially once Christmas time comes around. It's, it's insane. And now if there's football on or something like that, I'll probably watch that. But Christmas is where it's at because it brings me joy. It really does. And uh, I have some really great memories from Christmas time. I love Christmas lights. I mean, just think about it. You'll drive 20 minutes to go stare at some lights and drink hot cocoa, and they'll go home. Why? Because it brings us joy. And one of my favorite Christmas movies, and in fact, if you really watch it, probably shouldn't be for children because there's actually some inappropriate uh, things in there, but it's Christmas Vacation. A lot of us know that. Isn't that weird how sometimes you'll watch a movie and you won't think anything about it? And then you watch it again, and you, you're really paying attention. You're like, wow, I probably shouldn't watch this movie again. But unfortunately, those things are forever embedded in your mind, and you can't get rid of them. And it's probably because we're desensitized to sin. I mean, let's be honest, right? We hear words, and we, we see things, and we just get desensitized to it. But I'm going to use this as an illustration this morning. Um, one, of the, one of the points in the movie, Chevy Chase, is uh, he's the dad, you know, can't wait to bring everybody in for Christmas, and it l becomes a living nightmare for him. Well, he sets out on this mission. He reminds me so much of my dad. It's insane. Tall, goofy, their hair is the same. My dad used to wear these really, like, weird vests. They were huge puffer vests. You guys remember those? In fact, my dad used to have jackets that were, he had this really big red jacket. It probably stuck out about that far from his chest. Everybody thought he was a bodybuilder. It was so funny. Anyways, so uh, Chevy Chase is, is putting up the lights and he's stapling every light to the house on the roof, through the shingles. He's falling off on his ladders. I mean, he's totally destroying himself. He rips one of his sleeves off. I mean, it's a total nightmare, right? Well, finally, he's got all the lights ready to go. He did the whole house. He brings out the family, and they're out there shivering, and they're cold. And before the grand finale, he asked, he asked for a drum roll. And they didn't hear him. And he said, drum roll, please. And so they start going like that. And it's super dorky and weird. And at this moment, he, and he goes, joy to the world. And he goes, and nothing happens. And he looks at it. And he starts shaking it. He's like, what's, what's wrong here? He starts, he starts to lose his joy. He was so happy about what he had accomplished. And he starts to lose his joy. And he goes over and he kicks the, <laughs> he kicks the Santa thing in the yard. And he starts throwing stuff. And he just has had it, right? And then he's on a mission to figure out how he can fix the lights. All it came down to, actually, I'm not going to tell you in case you haven't seen it. Well, yeah, you probably, I don't know if you should see the movie or not. I don't know. You leave that up to you. Anyways, in Luke chapter 2, um, there's an angel. <laughs> there's some feedback going on this morning. In Luke chapter 2, there's an angel, and uh, he presents himself to some, some common people, shepherds in the field, and he announces this, do not be afraid, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people, for all people. Not just Jews, not just people in America, but people everywhere. And you know, there are some things in life that rob us of our joy, aren't there? I mean, think about it. Divorced parents, sexual abuse, school failure, relationships ending, uh, the, the passing of, of parents or children, financial struggles, angry legalistic preaching, or watered down false gospel, marriage growing pains, neighbors, neighbors can, can, can take your joy, 
failures in your job, in your ministry, in your family. Think about the world, right? ISIS, attacks, random attacks of violence because of a God named Allah. Rape, murder, beheadings, burnings, stealings. You can't even go to the mall without wondering, maybe somebody will break in here one day and, and shoot the place up. Planned Parenthood and their, their baby parts market, murdering innocent children, dismembering them from head to toe and sold for the slaughter. Vehicle accidents, suicides. There are a lot of things that can cause us to lose our joy. And we feel the struggles of this life. We feel the pain and the confusion and the disappointment with death. And we have suffering. And there have been times in my life, and it happens. Having joy all the time is difficult. It is hard. And there have been times where I've cried out to God, God, can you hear me? Are you there? Do you even care what I'm going through right now? The main passage that we're going to look at this morning is Romans chapter 15, verse 13. And Paul is writing to this church who have had a lot of difficult things go on. And look what Paul says here. He says, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in the hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. This church was going through a lot. Uh, they had a lot of inner, inner discord. You had Jews and Gentiles. They disagreed um, about Christian liberties. They disagreed about life. They had uh, different uh, as Greg said, they had different uh, meals that they would eat, different types of food, different types of regulations and things of that nature. Um, they might even have had a different philosophy of life, how you should raise your kids, what you should do with your spare time. And I can be honest with you, I think we can all identify with this, can't we? Staying away from that side. I think we can, you guys get me this morning. Uh, I think we can all identify with this. You know, I think about marriage problems, right? Angel and I, when you get married, holy smokes, dude, you have no clue how you can disagree with someone in your life and not even know it until you get married, you start living with a person. I mean, from how towels are folded, I can remember one time going to the closet and the towel was folded like it was a big square. And I'm like, what is this junk? You know what I'm saying? I'm like, babe, this, and we were actually starting to get into an argument about it. I'm like, this is how you fold a towel. You take one into the other, you fold it together, and then you go one, two, three, and you, and you roll it down. And I got upset about how towels were folded. I had, okay, I had a kind of a bad day, but still, right? You disagree about that stuff. Or even driving, right? Driving. There have been times I'll look over at Angel, I'm like, would you like me to pull over for you to drive? Because obviously you're a good instructor and you could just do everything, right? I read in the newspaper, this, this one guy said, <laughs> this one guy said, um, all of my dictionaries are, are for sale. He had this huge, massive, like, books that were just, you know, what were those things called that they used to sell to your door? Yeah, everybody knows about me. Anyways, he said, <laughs> hence, he said, encyclopedias are for sale. My wife knows everything. And I thought that was the funniest thing ever, right? Funniest thing ever. But it is true, we disagree, and, and there are things that you just, you, you have to work through. And that's what you can imagine the church at, 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 uh, at Rome being like, you know. Um, they're, they're disagreeing with each other uh, about some stuff, and they're starting to lose some of their joy. And things can steal our joy. I, I've gone through a lot of those things this morning. But let me give you a little background about this passage of scripture. Paul really deals with, with theology and the doctrine in chapters 1 through 11. Um, talks about how we are saved by faith through grace and baptism, where we're united with Christ. Talks about how our doctrine, what we believe, formulates the person that we become. Um, whether or not you have joy depends heavily on what you believe about the scriptures, about Jesus, and about theology. And so really he, he approaches how you should live um, with your mind. And then in, in chapters 12 through 15, he starts to deal with ethical doctrine. So theological doctrine, what you should believe, and then ethical doctrine, which basically is answering the question, what is right and what is wrong? And so Paul is saying this, in view of all that God has accomplished for his people in Christ, how should we live? What we know affects how we live and how we behave. And so I've got seven points up here for you. Just really br briefly, we're not going to bother reading this scripture here, but I just want to show you kind of Paul's mindset as he moves through this section. First of all, he says, grace demands a transformed life. You should be living differently. He says, grace demands unselfish service, no vengeance, no evil, but doing what is right. 
He says grace demands peace with civil authorities. We should obey our government. We should obey the law. He says that grace demands the superiority of love over the law. Don't be legalistic with some things. Learn to love people. And then, number five, he says grace demands um, grace in matters of opinion. If there's not a thus saith the Lord, we should be willing to give each other grace in those areas. He says grace demands proper management of Christian liberty. And this is what's so important, is that the rule of thumb is, is if it causes a, a weak person to stumble, I shouldn't do it. He instructs the church to do everything to build each other up, not tear each other down, but at the same time being true to yourself. And then finally, the passage that we read, the section that he gets into is our key phrase, is that grace demands that we live in unity and in hope. In unity and in hope. And when our lives are founded upon the gospel of grace, we will understand what joy is all about. And let me give you a brief understanding of the word joy. Um, Thayer, which is a very popular um, dictionary for, for the Greek, just simply defines joy as gladness. Vine's dictionary says that it's delight. It's, it's used over 60 times in the New Testament, and it is really closely associated with the word grace. In fact, you could say this, um, grace is that which bestows the occasion of pleasure, delight, or favorable regard. And so joy, if you could picture it, joy flows out of the cup of grace, right? We get joy because God has given us a gift. And let me give you a brief illustration. If you get a small little present, right, for Christmas, you know, think about this. If you get a small little present, you're like, wow, this is really cool, man, you know? Somebody gave me a $10 gift card to Starbucks, or, you know, somebody gave me a, a bag of cookies, which, you know, I, I love cookies. Uh, <clears throat> dropping a hint. So, grace comes out of, of uh, joy comes out of grace, but think about this. What if someone were to give you a new car, right, or to say all of your debt is paid off? I mean, you would be just totally super pumped, you know what I'm saying? Like joy would be so much more because the gift is that much bigger. And so, and so that's what grace is, um, or that's what joy is. It, it flows from grace. And that's what we have to understand. Billy Sunday said this um, when he's talking about joy. If you have no joy in your religion, there's a leak in your Christianity somewhere. William uh, Gurnall said this, the reason why many poor souls have so little um, joy in their hearts is that they have so little light of the gospel in their mind. The more we understand God's grace, the more we experience joy. And we really need to think about this because it is tough having joy. I have had my fair share of challenges and I still have a whole lot of life to live. And there are t in that moment, in that challenge, in that trial, all you want is for it to stop. Let the pain stop. Um, my wife and I were getting ready to have our first baby. I'm super excited about it. I can't wait. It's going to be a little baby girl. I can't wait to hold her and to kiss her and just to stay up all night and change her dirty diaper. I mean, I cannot wait for this little beautiful angel to come and that we get to share life with. But let me be honest with you. This, this pregnancy process, outside of, you know, the emotions that you feel, it has been tough. Going to the doctor, having different visits getting false information that leads you to a conclusion and you're upset and you're crying and you're sick to your stomach and you're worried, but that little baby is gonna come and everything's gonna be fine and we'll have joy, but it's the suffering that we wanna get rid of. I'd like for you to turn to 1 Peter chapter one with me. We could read a little bit more about this. What he's talking about here is something that gives us uh, an inability to express. The type of joy that we should have should almost come from an inability to express, being full of this joy that comes from God. And these early Christians, they were going through some stuff, man. I mean, think about it. It's like living in the Middle East, man. Being right there with ISIS, they're taking your homes, they're taking your, your children, your wives, they're burning people. I mean, they're just doing terrible stuff. And a lot of these early Christians dealt with that. Uh, they dealt with a lot of pagans who hated the idea that they believed that Jesus was the Christ, the son of the living God. Paul, who wrote this book, used to oversee the stonings of, of Christians, uh, people who would not renounce that Jesus is Lord. He would see people die. And that's, that's how these Christians were persecuted. And so look what Peter has to say here in verse six. In all of this, you greatly rejoice. All of this suffering. Though now for a little while, you, you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come so that the uh, proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise and glory and honor when Christ is revealed. 
Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Man, I have been down in the pits of what it feels like to have all your joy taken from you. And it's tough to remember the things that God wants us to remember in those times and to maintain a hold of joy. And we're going to talk about some of those things this morning. The Bible says in Philippians 4, 4, be joyful always, always. This is the flow of Christian life. This is the natural outcome of believing that Jesus Christ has died for your sins, of being baptized into Christ. The natural outcome of having your sins forgiven is having joy. And so for the Christian who doesn't have joy, there's a disconnect. There's something that is wrong. The key understanding is simply this, the basis for God filling us up with joy is our faith in the redeeming work of Christ. That is the foundation. That's why Paul deals with theology in the first 11 chapters, is because if you don't have the right beliefs, you're not going to have the right feelings, or your feelings will simply be misplaced. And so here's what we're looking at, right? It's simple. How to have joy this Christmas. Here's the first thing. There are four, four things that you should do in order to maintain joy and have joy grow and grow and grow. The first one, as I said, is to focus on your faith. We have something to rejoice about. Even when everything is taken from you, even when life seems difficult and it's hard, you fail, you break up, you get divorced, sin in life happens because life is messy, but we still have something to rejoice about. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 1. I'd like to, to read a verse to you about this. Philippians chapter 1. And look at verses 23 through 25. Here's what it says. Paul is, is, is torn right here because he knows if he dies, he's going to go be with Jesus, right? But at the same time, if he dies, he's going to leave his Christian family, the people who he really loves, that he's going to get to see one day again. And so he says this, I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body, convinced of this, that I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. Not in materials, not in your job, not in your kids' sports programs, not in money, not in your clothes, but your joy and progress in your faith. So focus on your faith. That is something that no one can take from you. And Paul says this in Romans 8. He says, angels, demons, heights, depths, powers, principalities, kingdoms, nobody can take that from you. The only person who can take that from you is yourself by giving it up. Nobody can take your faith, and that is something that gives us joy. Here's the second way to maintain joy this Christmas is the fellowship with the saints. I've gone on mission trips before uh, to Jamaica and the Dominican. I've taken local mission trips before, and there are some times where I'll miss two Sundays in a row, and you go down there and you experience church differently. I mean, we're talking about an hour and a half of singing, okay? I'm sweating, I'm hot, everybody wears shirt and ties and long pants, and it, I'll, I'll be honest with you, it's, it's miserable, okay? <laughs> because I'm not used to it, right? I break out in these rashes that go down my arms, and so going to a, a third world is, is a bodily sacrifice for me. And, you know, you're sitting there, and you're singing, and you're praising, and, you're, and I'm just sitting there thinking, man, all right, I love singing. Singing's great, and they're all hymnals, or hymnals. I do that all the time. Isn't that terrible? They're all hymns, but, uh, but you're like, all right, I'm, I'm ready to kind of, like, hear the word and, and move on with this thing, you know? I'm, dr I'm literally drenched in sweat before I even get up there to preach. And then you, you, you start to, you know, as you go throughout the week, and by the time you get home, you're like, man, I just want to see my church family, you know? I want to be with, with my brothers and sisters in the Lord, and I want to get back, you know, to my church, because there is nothing like fellowshipping with your family. And even though they're a part of the kingdom, and it's, it's a great experience, there is nothing like fellowshipping with your, with your home church. And that's what Peter says. Uh, and that's what John says. Look at 2 John chapter 12, or chapter 12, verse 12. I have it up there on the, uh, on the screen for you. He says, I have much to write you. He's writing to Christians. He says, but I do not want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. There are some Christians 
you know, that, I, that I'll never see again, that you have a connection with and you never see again, and that's, that's hard. And, and Paul, in, in Acts chapter 20, he was, you know, he was, he was struggling with, with his relationships. Um, and, and it's a hard thing to not be around your church family, but I can tell you this, one day we're going to get to see each other forever and eternity, and I, I simply, I can't wait. Life is good, and I enjoy it while I'm here, but there is something far better uh, that's going to give us inexpressible joy. So fellowshipping with the saints, man, you want to remain and have joy, c- become a part of the body. Be around your Christian family. Here's number three. Remember the goal. Remember the goal. Why you are here. Why you believe what you believe. The goal isn't simply just to get through life. Right? I, I was um, reading a book uh, with, a, with a couple of guys in church by N.T. Wright called After You Believe. And he kind of presents this question, why should we be Christians? You know, we become, we become Christians and, uh, you know, we believe in Jesus. Um, but what's, what's the point? What's the point of Christian morality? Like, why should I try to be a better person? Aren't we all going to go to heaven one day and be instantly perfect and have instant knowledge and everything's going to be great? So why even work here and now if everyone, once they get to heaven, are going to be the same, on the same playing field? You know what I'm saying? Have just as much knowledge as God does and be just as perfect as God does. And one of the things that he argues in his book is that what you do in this life really matters in the next life. There will be different uh, levels of knowledge, different levels of, of Christian maturity. We will have renewed nature, so sin really isn't going to be as tempting as it is now. But this is why it's so important. is because in remembering the goal of Christian living, we have to remember that what we do now really affects the next life. It affects us in character. It affects us in virtue. It affects us in knowledge. I'd like to read to you uh, a passage of scripture in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 13, where Peter says this, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. That we have to remember what I'm going through right now, the sufferings that I'm enduring right now, the glory of that, the joy of that will be revealed when Jesus comes again. What we do right now, these many snapshots of what Christmas is all about, is just a small little glimpse of what it's going to be like to spend eternity with Jesus forever and with each other. That the sufferings and the trials that we endure now are working out in us an eternal weight of glory to be revealed when Jesus comes again. What you go through and how you deal with it really does matter to God. And that's something that we should always remember. That we can rejoice in everyday afflictions, in our sickness, in our heartbreak, in our frustration as we approach death. Because we have an ultimate destiny with Jesus. But here's the last thing that I believe is most important. The number one way for you to keep your joy this Christmas is to love and pass it on. You see, it's pretty simple. The only way we keep our joy is to pass it on. That's what Jesus taught us. If you're struggling with joy this Christmas, make somebody else's life more joyful. Bring somebody joy, and I can promise you That when you love people with a deep, godly love, your joy will start to fill up. And this is what Jesus says in John chapter 15. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. And if you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commands and remained in his love. And then look at verse 11. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that joy may be complete. My command is this, to love each other as I have loved you. That's it. Love is the key to joy and passing it on. This beautiful theological truth of knowing that God loved Jesus and Jesus loved God. And Jesus passed on that love, and so he's commanding us to pass on that love, that that is the key to our joy being complete. I've got a picture up here of a little girl. Her name's Sapphire. And in 2013, uh, the girl's father, uh, family, they were living uh, in a house, and they had an arson attack. And uh, it uh, 
destroyed their home. And the father, uh, that when they found the little girl, the father was, was hovering over her to protect her from the flames. And she lost uh, a lot of her body and her skin. And he died. Mom died. Siblings died. She lost her favorite shirt, her favorite toys. She lost everything. She lost it all. She lost her body. And you can only imagine what she's thinking when she gets up every day, you know, and she sees herself. And if I were there, if I had the, and I'm going to write her a letter, uh, if I had the opportunity to tell her something, I would tell her that she is beautiful. She is beautiful. And this Christmas, um, there was a story that was published, and all she wants for Christmas is cards to fill up her tree, her Christmas tree. That's all she wants. She doesn't want things. She doesn't want toys. She simply wants joy. You can see her holding that little card of joy. And the story said this, that Sapphire has lost everything. Her father, her mother, her sister, her brothers, her home, her favorite toy, her favorite outfit, everything that was familiar to her. And in living with her aunt, she even lost the one thing that we all take for granted, her reflection. But she wakes up every morning with a smile on her face because she understands the true definition of hope, of faith, and of love. Joy is all about love. And so I wrote her address up here for you. And if you want to, you can send her a card in the mail to pass on that joy. You can send her a card in the mail, and I plan to. And I encourage you to do the same thing. But don't just stop with her. Share it and pass it on to other people. You know, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, it talks about Jesus and the suffering that he endured on the cross. And it says this, For the joy and the hope that was set before him, Jesus endured the shame of the cross. Despising its shame, he ran the race that was set before him. And as you go through this Christmas, I want you to think about that. We all go through struggles and trials and temptations. But let's be and look like Jesus. Let's look unto him who looked at the cross, but he looked past it because he saw the joy of eternity in heaven with God. And that's something that can never be taken away from us. And that's something that we offer every Sunday morning. If you're sitting here and you've been struggling having joy, the one way to get joy is to have your sins forgiven. Get right with God. Be baptized into his name after you've placed your faith and your trust in Jesus. Obey the gospel and live your life looking past this world into eternity and into joy. So I'm going to ask that you stand with me now. And we're going to pray and sing a song of invitation. And if there's anyone here that wants to obey the gospel, we're going to invite you to do that at this time. Let's pray. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for dying for us, Lord. God, I pray that if there's anyone here who needs and wants to place their faith and trust into you to obey the gospel, that they'll do that here and now. We thank you, Lord. We praise you in Jesus' name.